Welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about the second derivative test. And previously we discussed how the second derivative can be used to determine the concavity of functions. And so if you're not familiar with the concept of concavity, feel free to check out our previous lesson if you haven't already seen it, because that's going to be very important to understanding this lesson. But not only can the second derivative be used to determine concavity of functions, it can also be used to perform a test for the location of relative extrema, meaning a relative minimum or a relative maximum. And so just like the first derivative test, the second derivative test is a test to find the location of those relative extrema. And so if you take a look at these two graphs here, our first one here, this would be an example of a concave down function. So I'll write that this is concave down. And when a function is concave downward, it means that the slope is decreasing as you go along the function. So the slope here is gonna be greater than a slope here, and the slope here is greater than over here, and so as you go along, the slope just continues to decline and decline as you move along the graph. And so what this means is that the rate at which the slope is changing, or the second derivative, is going to be less than zero, or negative. And so not only that, we also have a relative maximum at the peak on this concave down function. So we would write that this is a relative max. And so what we find here is that if your function has a critical value where the slope is zero, such as this point right here, and the function is concave down at that point on the function, meaning that the second derivative is less than zero, then that critical value is going to be a relative maximum. But what about this function over here? Well, this is an example of a concave upward function, or concave up, so I'll label that as concave up. And in this case, the slope, or the first derivative, is increasing as we move along this function, right? The slope at this point right here is negative, but as you move along the function, that slope begins to move closer to zero until it hits zero, and then it gets greater in the positive direction afterwards. The slope just continues to get steeper. And so in this case, the rate at which the slope changes, or the second derivative, is going to be greater than zero, or positive. And you'll also notice, on a function like this, where it is concave up, that if we have a critical value where the slope is zero, it's going to be a relative minimum. Right, this is the lowest point in this area, just like this relative maximum is the highest point in this area. So when you have a critical value on a function, and that function is concave up in that region, then that critical value is a relative minimum. And so that's the premise of the second derivative test. If you know what your critical values are, and then you test them on your second derivative to see if the value is less than zero or greater than zero, you can determine whether you have a relative max or a relative min. And so now before we look at an example of using the second derivative test, let's quickly look at the formal definition so we really get an idea of what we're doing. So here's the formal definition of the second derivative test, and it can look a little daunting at first, but trust me, it's actually very simple and not too hard to follow. So if we let c be a critical value on a function, meaning that the slope or the first derivative at that value of c is equal to zero, and the second derivative of that point c exists on an open interval, then we can follow the following guidelines. If the value of the second derivative at the critical value c is greater than zero, meaning that it is positive or the function is concave up, then that point at c and then the y value for that c, if you were to plug it into the function, is a relative minimum. If the value of the second derivative at that critical value is less than zero, meaning it's negative or the function is concave down at that point, then that point is a relative maximum. And then if the second derivative at that point c is equal to zero, which we didn't talk about until now, then the test fails. And so in that case, we're gonna have to revert back to using the first derivative test. All right, and so that's the definition of the second derivative test, but let's finally see it in action by looking at an example problem. So here we have an example. We wanna use the second derivative test to identify all relative extrema for this function. We have f of x equals x cubed minus three x squared plus one. And just like the first derivative test, the first thing you wanna do for the second derivative test is to find your critical values where the first derivative is equal to zero. So even though this is the second derivative test, we still need to use the first derivative to find our critical values. Do not set your second derivative equal to zero 
That's how you find inflection points, which deals with concavity. In this case, we are just looking for the points where the slope is zero, which are our critical values, which is where relative extrema occur. So let's find our first derivative and find those critical values. So f prime of x is going to be equal to 3x squared. That's the derivative of x cubed using the power rule. And then we'll have minus 6x because negative 3 times 2 is negative 6. And then subtract 1 from 2 to get the power of 1. And then a derivative of 1 is just 0. So we don't need to write that. And so now let's set our first derivative equal to 0. And then we'll solve for x and find our critical values. So I have 3x squared minus 6x. And I see a common factor here of 3x that I can pull out. And that's going to help us solve this. So we're going to have 0 equal to 3x times x minus 2. Right, if we take 3x out of this term, then we'll just be left with 1x. And if you divide 3x out of negative 6x, you're left with just negative 2. And then we can set each one of these quantities equal to 0. So I we'll have 3x equals 0 and x minus 2 equal to 0, which tells us that x equals 0 and x equals 2. And so those are going to be our two critical values for our function. Now, unlike the first derivative test, the second derivative test requires that we also take the second derivative, and that's what we're going to use to test these values. So now let's take our second derivative. So f double prime of x is going to be equal to 2 times 3, and then subtract 1 from our exponent. So we're going to have 6x, and then the derivative of negative 6x is just going to be minus 6. And so now we have our second derivative. So now all we have to do for the second derivative test is to plug our critical values into the second derivative and see if the output is positive or negative. And that's going to help us determine whether we have a relative max or a relative min. So let's start with x equals 0. If we plug 0 into our second derivative, we'll have f double prime of 0 is equal to 6 times 0 minus 6. And so that's going to be equal to 6 times 0, which is 0 minus 6. So that's just going to be equal to negative 6. And so that is negative, right? Negative 6 is a negative value. So that tells us that x equals 0 is going to be a relative maximum, right? It's kind of the opposite. If you have a negative value, you're going to have a relative max. And if it's positive, you're going to have a relative min. But think about it like this. When you have a negative value for your second derivative, that means that in that area, your function is concave downward. So that means it is shaped like this, which means that the point that we're looking at where the slope is 0 is going to be the maximum in that area. So hopefully that kind of helps you see why when you have a negative value for your second derivative, it's a maximum rather than a minimum. And so then let's move on to x equals 2 and plug that into our second derivative. And so I have f double prime of 2, and that's going to be equal to 6 times 2 minus 6. And so we're going to have 12 minus 6, which is equal to positive 6. So I'll erase that and write positive 6. Now in this case, our second derivative is positive. And so that means that we're going to have a function that is concave up, which means that that critical value is going to be the relative minimum, right? So we have a positive value for our second derivative, which means we have a relative minimum. So I'm going to erase these graphs and let's actually find the full point for our relative maximum at x equals 0 and our relative minimum at x equals 2. So in order to find the full point, we're going to need to plug 0 into our original function, which if you do that, you're going to have 0 cubed, which is 0, minus 3 times 0 squared, which is also 0, plus 1. So we're just going to have 1. And so our relative max is going to be at 0, 1. That's going to be our relative max. And then for x equals 2, we'll plug that into our function here. And I'll write that out. We'll have f of 2 is equal to 2 cubed minus 3 times 2 squared plus 1. And if we go through this, 2 cubed is equal to 8, and then minus 3 times 2 squared. 2 squared is 4. 4 times 3 is 12, so then 8 minus 12 is negative 4, plus 1 is negative 3. So that means that our other point is going to be at 2, negative 3, and that's going to be our relative minimum. And so that's the final answer to this problem. We used the second derivative test to find all the relative extrema for this function. Let's look at one more example for this lesson. So for our last example, we're going to be doing the same thing. We're going to be using the second derivative test to identify all the relative extrema for this function. And we have a different function this time. We have x cubed minus 6x squared plus 12x plus 3. And so just like we did in our last example, we're going to start by finding the critical values of our function. And that comes from setting the first derivative equal to 0, not the second derivative. 
So let's start by finding those critical values. So we'll have f prime of x is equal to 3x squared minus 12x plus 12, right? The derivative of this function using the power rule for each term is going to give us this quantity times three and then subtract one from our exponent to get 3x squared, two times negative six to get negative 12 and then subtract one to be left with a power of one. And then the derivative of 12x is just 12 and the derivative of three is just zero because three is a constant. And so then let's set this equal to zero and solve for our critical values. So we'll have zero is equal to 3x squared minus 12x plus 12. And I see a common factor of three in each of these terms that I can take out. So I'll do that. We're gonna have zero is equal to three times x squared minus four x plus four, right? So we just took three out of each of these terms. And so then we can factor this quadratic that's left over. And since the coefficient of our x squared term is one, right? There's not a two or a three in front of it. It's just x squared, which means it's one times x squared we can use a nice little trick to factor by just asking ourselves what two factors of four, our last term added together, will give us the coefficient of our middle term. So in this case, what two factors of four added together will give you negative four. Well, in this case, two times two is equal to four, but that would give us positive four if we added them together. So how about we try negative two times negative two, because those two numbers added together would give you negative four. So that means in this case, if we were to factor, we'd have zero is equal to three times x minus two times x minus two, right? Negative two times negative two gives you positive four and negative two plus negative two is negative four. And so now we have factored this function. And now what we can do is set each of these quantities equal to zero, but they're actually the same quantity. So we only really need to do it once. So we'll have x minus two is equal to zero, which means that x is gonna be equal to two, right? We can do that for the other quantity, but it's going to give us the same thing that x is equal to two. So we don't really need to do that. So we only have one critical value for this function. And so now the next part of our second derivative test is to take the second derivative of our function. So we're gonna take the derivative of our first derivative next. So we'll have f double prime of x is going to be equal to two times three, which is going to be six, and then subtract one from our exponent to just be left with six x, and then we'll have negative 12, right? The derivative of negative 12 x is negative 12, and then derivative of positive 12 is just zero since it's a constant. And so now we can plug our critical value of x equals two into our second derivative and see whether it is a relative minimum or relative maximum. And so we'll have f double prime of two is equal to six times two minus 12. And so six times two is equal to 12. And then 12 minus 12 is, uh oh, that's gonna be equal to zero. And so if you remember from when we looked at the definition of the second derivative test, we said that if the value on the second derivative for that critical value is zero, our second derivative test fails and that we have to go back and use the first derivative test. So that's a bit unfortunate, but it's going to happen. You're going to have functions where if you try to use the second derivative test, you're gonna find that the value of some critical values on the second derivative are going to be equal to zero. And so while it might be tempting at this point to just say, oh, there's no relative extrema, don't do that because it is possible that although your second derivative test didn't tell you if this is a relative min or max, the first derivative test still might do that. So let's see if it does. It's not guaranteed. It doesn't mean we're going to find a relative max or min using the first derivative test, but there's always that chance that it might be one of those relative extrema. And so let's go through and use the first derivative test for this scenario and see what kind of result we get. So if you remember with the first derivative test, we like to draw this number line. And so I'll do that here and we'll label our one critical value of x equals two. And now we can see that the two intervals that we're gonna have to test in this case to see where our function is increasing and decreasing, which is what we do for the first derivative test, we're gonna see that it's from negative infinity to two, and then from two to positive infinity. Again, if this is new to you, if you haven't seen the first derivative test, I do have a video on the first derivative test that you can check out, so I'll link that right here for you to look at if you need to do that. But the two intervals that we're gonna be testing here are from negative infinity to two and then from two to positive infinity. And so now let's pick a value between negative infinity and two and plug it into our first derivative to see if our slope is positive or negative. So I'll have f prime and I'm gonna choose zero to be my value. And if we plug zero into our first derivative, which is over here, we'll have zero in this term and then zero in this term and then positive 12. So we'll just have 12. And so since that slope is positive, we know that our function is increasing on that interval. So I'll label that on our number line as well. We'll have that plus there. And then let's look at our second interval here from two to infinity. 
I'm going to plug in 3 into our first derivative, and that's going to be a little more complex than plugging in 0, so I'll write it out. We'll have 3 times 3 squared minus 12 times 3 plus 12. And so that's going to be equal to 3 times 3 squared, which is 3 times 9, and that's equal to 27. And then 12 times 3 is 36, and then we're still adding 12. So 27 minus 36 is going to be negative 9, and then negative 9 plus 12 is positive 3. And so this is just equal to positive 3, and so I'll write that which is also a positive slope, which means our function is still increasing on that interval. And so we'll also label that on our number line. And so what we find here is that around our critical value, the slope of our function is positive on both sides, which means our function is increasing around our critical value. And if you remember from the first derivative test that when the sign of your function's slope doesn't change, meaning it's positive positive or negative negative, around that critical value, you do not have a relative extrema at that point. It's not gonna be a relative min, and it's not going to be a relative max. And so in this case, our second derivative test failed, and our first derivative test concludes that there is no relative extrema here because the function is increasing on both sides of our critical value. So in this case, we did all this work to come to the conclusion that there is no relative extrema. So it's a bit unfortunate that that is the conclusion we came to because we did go through all of this work, but that's just going to happen sometimes. You're gonna go through a lot of work and you're not gonna find any relative extrema. So while the second derivative test is very helpful in finding relative extrema, it's not always going to work. And so just be prepared for that when you do practice examples of the second derivative test, it's not always going to work. You're going to get some values that are equal to zero where the test fails. But that's all I had for this lesson. If you wanna see some more example problems, I will have an example video linked at the end of this video, as well as in the description below. If you have any questions, feel free to leave those in the comments. But if you don't have any questions, this is all I had for now. So I will see you next time.